welcome to another episode of the Icarus Idea. Now, as this is the podcast where we try to find out what you can do after finishing industrial design, this episode we're talking to someone who's done something completely different from what we've seen so far. And she leaves us with an advice that she thinks is rather basic, but probably I'm going to follow it myself. So, well, if you enjoy the episode, we would greatly appreciate it if you let us know what you think. Also, if you don't enjoy the episode, we'd love to hear it. Like, subscribe, but above all, hope you enjoy, hope you learned something, because we certainly did. Hey, welcome to another episode of the Icarus Idea. Thank you so much for listening in. My name, as always, is Joris. And as almost always, I'm here with two other people, one of which is the classic Bram. Hello. And Bram, would you, as always, introduce our guest for today? Starting to get a routine. But yeah, yeah sure. Welcome back, everyone. It's uh, our housing month, and two weeks ago we had a talk with Team Casa, who built a complete house, and in the future they will even build a complete supermarket. So now that Joris and I know everything to build a complete house, it's time for us to decorate it. And once again, we want to learn from the experts. So that's why we invited Jill Hutte. She was a freelance interior designer who designed furniture, but also multiple interiors, such as the new offices of Mesa Plus, and a meeting point which can be found in one of the buildings at University of Twente. So we're curious what we're going to learn from her, so welcome, Jill Hutte. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. How are you doing today? I'm good. I just finished working and now I'm here. Let's go. Nice. Let's dive right into it because we don't have that much time. We were quite surprised when we looked at your resume, your LinkedIn during our usual stalking session that you did quite a lot of freelance work, which is pretty cool, I think. But we were wondering... Like I did some freelance work as well, but then you have to do like cold calls and acquisition and all that stuff. But how did you end up uh, doing projects for the university? Because you did two interior designs for the university, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of them was actually my bachelor assignment. So probably that worked out the way that most bachelor assignments work out. I just looked at these sites where you find bachelor assignments. And one of them was for the university. And then I just applied and I got the job, basically. So that was my first interior job. And then afterwards, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life. And I needed to take a break in between bachelor and master. Okay. Um, and after I had been to Vietnam, I came back and I talked to the project leader of my bachelor assignment and asked her if she knows something for me to work basically because I knew I wanted to do something in between and I wanted to earn some money so I just had a coffee with her and then it was just pure luck because she just had have yeah had an email from Mesa Plus that they were looking for someone that could redesign the offices in a way that the design lab design lab was made because yeah. The project leader for my first interior job was also the one from Design Lab. So then sort of fire, 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 I yeah, got a new job at the university. So that was for Mesa Plus. And I went there to have sort of a job interview and they were asking me if I wanted to make the interior. And then I said, yeah, sure. If I can also be the project leader, I will do that. <laughs> so then. <laughs> I was both project leader and interior designer for Mesa Plus. So that's how that worked out. <laughs> you just walked in and were like, I want to do it, but only if I can be the boss of it all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but what does project leader specifically mean in this case? Yeah, so I basically just was the one responsible for everything to get done. So I knew that at the facility service center mm -hmm. there, they um, have project leaders that take on all the interior jobs, basically. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to be one of those because I was working with one in the project before. And uh, yeah, I just thought, oh, it would be a nice experience to, to do the same job, basically. So that's why I wanted to do that, just to get also some experience as project leader. Yeah. Sick. I don't think that many people can say that. 
no. even before finishing their master and be like, yeah, I've been a project leader on this and this and this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in the end, I was sort of a co-project leader, to be completely honest, because facility service wasn't really into having an external <laughs> project leader. <laughs> so <laughs> there was also another one. But I was the one within Mesa Plus, and they were really cute about it, actually. They were always saying, our project leader is going to do this and this now. So they were very cute. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I didn't know you did an, uh, like a, what's that called, a gap year mm -hmm. in Vietnam. Was it one of those gap years where you think in the beginning, I'm going to figure stuff out about myself and I'm going to think, and, uh, and then you come back and you're like, what did you do last year? And I'm, yeah, there were some beaches in Thailand and that was about and it. Cocktails. Yeah, <laughs> cocktails, doing nothing. Did you figure anything out about yourself? No, not really. Or was it like, did you, did you learn anything that made you, let's say, better out um, of that year? I think that Vietnam itself didn't really uh, give me any new insights, but basically I needed a break as well because mm -hmm. I thought that the bachelor was quite intense. So afterwards I just took that break, went to Vietnam with my brother uh, just on you know vacation. And when I came back, I took on that Mesa Plus project and that's, when I both had something to do, which is always good if you take a gap. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't just sit around and do nothing. That doesn't bring you <laughs> yeah. anywhere, basically. Fair enough. Um, and also, I had some time next to it to think about what I wanted to do with my master's. So that also took a lot of that year, actually, hmm. for and reflection. And you, you still decided to do the industrial design engineering master? Mm-hmm. I, I basically um, mailed Eric on a Sunday night, which is oh. a pro tip, actually, to mail Eric always on Sunday nights. Yeah. <laughs> then he might write it down myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that. Um, and then he actually re replied within like five minutes because I asked him if I could talk to him because I heard that he can help a lot with uh, yeah, p helping people to figure out what they want from life yeah. basically so then i talked to him about what i wanted to do and he basically told me that management of product development is just <laughs> free choices all over the place mm -hmm. and i really <laughs> liked that so that's why i yeah stayed in twente yeah yeah and eric for the ones that don't go to enschede is mm -hmm. the sort of the supervisor not of industrial design but of the management management of product development track and just an overall teacher who knows everyone. You did a lot of interior design. Let's let's get like get into the the actual interior design now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We were wondering, just maybe maybe start with how does the basic process of designing an entire yeah. interior how does that go? Yeah. And mm. Where was it, by the way? Is is in the citadel? Yeah, I. Uh, it was in the citadel. Um, it's not anymore because they moved part of the stuff in the new building of Atlas, yeah. but okay, okay. It, yeah. it was in All the right. Citadel, yeah. Um, okay, so from the perspective of industrial designers, it's pretty much a typical design process because, I mean, I don't know how an interior designer would approach it because I only did it like the way we learned it basically. So it's very user-centered how I experienced yeah. it. Um, so what I did uh, in all of my interior jobs is that I sort of started the process with analyzing and gathering all the different opinions and wishes and requirements. So for Atlas or University College, I had some workshops where people could go to and tell me what they wanted in their new place, what they wanted from their meeting point. I also had interviews with multiple people that wanted to tell me uh, a bit more in detail what they would like in, from their new meeting point. So I designed a meeting point for University College. Mm -hmm. And then for Mesa Plus, there were way less people. So I didn't really have to do a workshop in the beginning. So for, with them, I had interviews with every, with every single one working for Mesa Plus, basically. And I asked all of them, what is it that you like about the old office? What is it that you want from the new office? And 
it's actually an interesting process because from the management team, you get a certain opinion and they also articulate it in a way that they expect you to do what they want you to do. Okay. And then you have the users, which are also you know, part of the team and a bigger group of people, basically. Um, and they very often have either completely different ideas or they already had talked to the management team and therefore say the same thing. Biased. <laughs> so you sort of have to filter what's already been articulated by the management and you have to find a way to yeah, actually find the needs of the different people. So that's the interesting part about it, about that first part of the process is to really get everything on one page and not just do what the management wants. No. And then afterwards, I work together with an architect on the Mesa Plus project. So we together organized some workshops where we presented some floor plans, so concepts for the floor plan. And then with the whole group, the, we discussed it and looked whether the floor plans match the different needs and wishes. And then we adjusted that again. So then it's just a process of iterations, basically, where you develop concepts and then you uh, communicate with the users and then you just adjust the concept. And I think that maybe for interior, it's even more iterative than it can be in a design process, basically because you have the specific users in front of you and you can take every opinion into account. And when you de develop a product, a product, which is yeah for a really big group of people, then I feel like you can't take every opinion into account, but with interior, you sort of have to, because, because otherwise you will lose people in the process. Mm. So that's how I experienced it. Yeah. Sounds like a really typical design project. Yeah. 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 Cool. But I do like the difference between having to like come up with the, the average user that you intended to use and being able to simply interview all of the users and be like, okay, this is, this is it. This is everyone. It gives some kind of security, I guess. Mm -hmm. some, yeah. But it also makes it difficult because you will always have different opinions. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you cannot like, you really have to find the middle ground. So it's basically, you do the same thing again. You actually make another persona, which is the middle ground. So oh, yeah. You still make, oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah. So you still make the average user then, I guess. Yeah, sort of. It doesn't, yeah. When I think about it, it really is the same thing when you get everything on the, everyone on the same page, but the process is a bit different. Yeah. Okay. So conclusion, it's exactly the same as all the other design process that anyone has ever done. Um, for me it is, but that's the <laughs> thing, right? That's probably because of my background. If I would have studied in uh, interior design, my process would look different, yeah. I think. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. If you design an interior, do you then also design all the furniture or do you go to, I don't know, like chairs.google.com and just select the chair that you want? Like, how does that go? Uh, depends. So for um, uh, Atlas University College and Mesa Plus, I designed some elements of furniture that are, that, that should fulfill a specific function. So at Atlas, we had a podium with like some sort of a house under which you had a bar and a kitchen and that is more protected in like the big room that it was placed. So something like that, you can't really buy that easily. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's the benefit of having an industrial designer. They can just also design the furniture for you. <laughs> so yeah, um, so in both those projects, there are elements like that, that you just can't buy in another store. So then we just designed it ourselves and then someone built them. And then now actually in my new job, I'm also the chef interior because I'm working for a startup. So they are like growing and always need to find new offices. And then I ah. also design these offices here now. And, yeah. he, and here we just buy furniture. Yeah. Uh, and then depending on, you know, the functionalities and the style that we decided in the group again, 
with all opinions taken into account. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So the process here was the same, just that I didn't design specific furniture elements. Yeah. Oh, that's not true. We did order two really big tables for the meeting rooms that are custom made. So it's not mm. even true what I'm saying. <laughs> Why? You... Lie. Why but... you lying? <laughs> <laughs> Now, I saw that for the design of the university, you wanted to fight the community space and the casual workspace. Is that what a podium was for? Yeah. Did you also design other cool features that made it possible? Um, whew, so long ago. <laughs> um, yeah, probably. So we had like the, the artificial grass and then the podium. The, those were the two areas. Yeah. We also made custom tables that turned out a bit different than I had in mind, but we did like design what did, those. What did what? you have in mind then? Oh no, they just they look a bit different than we imagined them because we wanted like see through legs, but that's very expensive. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so they are not see through now, but it would have been very cool. <laughs> Yeah, they would have matched with the chairs, wouldn't they? Because the chairs are yeah. see-through, right? Yeah, they also bought different chairs. So oh. that's also a thing about oh. interior projects. You very often don't get everything that you think about implemented. Yeah. Yeah. At least my interior projects. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> no, but yeah, so we designed the table specifically so you could form different groups to work in different constellations. So, yeah. With the Atlas project, we or I designed a lot of specific elements that had to be made specifically. Yeah. Yeah. And did you also build them yourself or did you just make someone else do that? <laughs> I made someone else do that in that case. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you said it like that felt good. Like, I made someone else do that. <laughs> <laughs> I was a project leader, you know? <laughs> I can do that type of stuff. <laughs> No, but um, actually uh, the podium was just made by a professional company and then the tables were made by the dream team from Design Lab. Oh. So, yeah. Hmm. yeah, there were a lot of tables. If I would have made them myself, that would have been, it would have taken a long time. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. we know that you made something yourself. We saw it on your portfolio and we saw them in real life like a couple of years ago, I think. It's the... Wooble, what's it? It's not a chair. It's a what's it called? A stool. All right. So it's a wooble stool. You made that when you were on a exchange in Linköping in Sweden. Um, I'm thinking about what I want to ask now. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I want to ask is, you said about the Linköping uh, semester. What you did there is that you learned about Swedish. Well, I can imagine that, but also about the material wood. But what was it made it so specific that you felt like ah? I want to put this on my portfolio site that I'm now so acquainted with wood. Maybe I can answer that question by telling you why I did that course. Mm -hmm. yeah, cool. So basically, uh, when I went to Sweden, like the whole idea of going to Sweden was actually for interior design. Because ah. when I started my bachelor's in industrial design, I thought that I wanted to become an, an interior designer or a furniture designer. And then when it came to the minor, I knew I wanted to go to a different country. And then I very, very quickly knew I wanted to go to Scandinavia because of furniture design. So because when it comes to style, I'm most at home in Scandinavian design. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. So then when I moved to Sweden, I thought I really wanted to learn about that Scandinavian design. Then one of the courses that I could take was the design in wood. That's what it was called. And I was like, ooh, that's the most Scandinavian material there is. <laughs> and I was also on a bit of a hating plastic trip. <laughs> okay, because, makes, sense. makes sense, yeah. Because of sustainability. So that's why I took the course, Design and Wood. Um, and then I put it on my portfolio, basically, because it matched my ambitions to become an interior designer. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. that makes sense then. You, you sound quite passionate about wanting to become a furniture designer and an interior designer. And you did well, minors, you did freelance work. Um, 
but now you are a concept developer at Enflux, mm -hmm. which seems to me like a company that does, it helps companies, organizations, municipalities to become more adaptive or adapted to climate change by using socioeconomic opportunities. So it's basically, I think the alignment of social and economic opportunities with adapting to climate change, I think. Mm, yeah, adapting to climate change is one of it, uh, one of the aspects and also preventing further climate change. So it's basically mm -hmm. about creating a new type of economy that is not only adaptive, but also circular and just plainly sustainable in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if you're so passionate about furniture, interior, why did you choose this job? Hmm. I think uh, here we enter very typical um, struggles of choosing what you want from life. Okay. No, but um, I wanted to become an interior designer and I did it, but I also felt like it was not enough. Okay. while doing it. So firstly, I don't really think of myself as like a typical designer that likes to draw all the time. That's also why I did m more the management of product yeah. development track. And then secondly, I felt like I can't really make big, a big impact with interior. And if you talk about impact, then you can look at it like you can have an impact with everything you do if you make it as good as possible, basically. But I wanted to create like big impact. Okay. So, you know, in my gap year, I was thinking about whether I wanted to continue on the track of interior design. And I really quickly noticed that I didn't really want to do that because of the lack of impact. And then I was thinking about how can I combine this passion for, you know, the living environment of people and yeah, where they just live their lives with my ambition to yeah, create impact in sustainability, basically. And that's how I got into sort of city planning and public space rather than interior design. And then Enflux, the company that I now work at, is also doesn't really do city planning, but everything that they do has to do with the living environment. If you talk about climate adaptation, it's about the ad adaptation of the living environment uh, on, yeah, on the changes to the changes of climate to the change, changes. to the changes of climate change. And then also with circularity, it very often is about how to change the way to construct a house or the way to construct a whole neighborhood, basically. So then now what I did with interior design, I just do on a bigger scale and more abstract yeah. and with more impact, basically. So I see that link, you know, to yeah. wanting to uh, have something to do with a living environment. Yeah. It seems like you figured out how to combine those two things. Yeah. But I must say also at Enflux, I'm not completely sure whether or not it's creative enough yet, but I do like the impact that we make. <laughs> how, what do you mean not creative enough then? Mm, well, it's very, very abstract and a lot about change of processes. So yeah. we also do sort of consultancy on how to be more sustainable. So that's more content related, but a lot of it is really process related and we change the processes of mm. municipalities and provinces. Yeah. What, what do you do then specifically as your day-to-day -day job? Um, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> Just in hmm. designing the interior yeah. <laughs> of the office. I ordered yeah. some chairs. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually last week. <laughs> no, but um, it's difficult because we work on project base or we work project based basically. And we do a lot of different projects. So right now I'm working on a tool that helps to find the most urgent spots to do climate adaptation. But I also right. work on a roadmap for a circular area development. And I also work on the covenant climate adaptation in South Holland. So where it's basically about, yeah, again, having different opinions of different partners and trying to find the middle ground for all of them. So it's, 
it's very, yeah, multiple different projects, which I really like. So my day, my day to day life is not really easy to describe because it changes a lot. It's a lot of meetings and then thinking very hard and then meeting again. <laughs> yeah, basically. Reaching things. Yeah. Presenting things. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So final question, Joel. Mm -hmm. um, you might not be old, but you are experienced. So based on that experience, I see you looking really like weird. Uh, what the fuck is he saying? <laughs> I'm just Based curious. on that experience, what would be, we ask this to everyone, like what would be your advice to anyone else or to Bram, to me, to any industrial design engineer studying industrial design right now? Oui. It can be anything. Yeah, I found choosing what I want to do really hard, actually, for a long time. And then I basically also took that time to decide. And I think my advice would be not to be too quick about it. I think it all falls into its place if you think about it for a while and try different things and don't stress too much about it. Well, I did that a lot, actually. <laughs> but... Uh, I don't know. For me, it's not, you know, it's not a straight way. This sounds so horrible. <laughs> it's like the most basic advice ever. Life is a roller coaster. You just got to ride it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically that. No, but it's really true. I mean, look at what I did, right? I did some interior design and then I decided, oh... I basically want to do something with the living environment, but with more impact. And then I completely change track and you can always do that. So you don't have to have it all figured out. Yeah. Fair enough. And also do sustainable stuff. That's another <laughs> advice. It's very good for the world. Is it an <laughs> advice or an opinion? <laughs> Both. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> I think a lot of people have the, the struggle. Personally, I have the struggle as well because I'm now doing my thesis. And people ask, oh, do you know what you're going to do afterwards? And I'm like, no, I don't. <laughs> and I have a podcast about finding out what you can do afterwards. <laughs> and I don't even know. Oh, it feels ridiculous. But, I, but think I guess one small passion can already sort of be a stepping stone to whatever you find. If it's furniture and you find yourself being a concept developer for sustainability, just with that one small step. So, yeah. yeah. What was the, like the... Was there a point at which you thought, yes, now I am certain of what I want to do? At multiple points where you, like, yeah, there were multiple points where I just took a break and then reflected on what I was doing for the last couple of years or months. Mm -hmm. And then I always found some conclusion to it, uh, basically. And then with that conclusion, I could go further. So I don't think it's about finding the thing you want to do for the rest of your life, but just the next step. So after my bachelor's, when I did my freelance interior stuff and talked to Eric about my future, and I decided to do management of product development, it really felt like, oh, I'm going to learn a lot in the next two years and I can just do whatever I want. And I filled it in with like, random sustainability related neighborhood upgrading related stuff so that's how it moved slowly towards being a concept developer mm. nice. <laughs> and then again after my graduation i took a break and reflected on what i was doing and now it feels again like i did the right choice or made the right choice and then i think i will do it the same next time basically mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it answers pretty well, actually. One last question. Well, like the fourth last question now. But this reflecting, how does that look? Is it you sitting on a couch with a cup of tea? Is it you meditating on the top of a mountain? Is it talking to people? How does that um, go? All of them combined. Did you actually sit on top of a mountain and meditate? <laughs> No, but I always also went on a holiday okay. to just get out of it and really don't think about it. And then afterwards, think about it again. And then I also always talk to a lot of people. So it's sort of taking a break, 
then thinking about what I want, then talking to a lot of people, and during those conversations, normally notice what I really want to do. Yeah. yeah. So familiar. it's all of them. Cool. Then I think we uh, just established a nice roadmap for anyone <laughs> that doesn't know what they want to do. Yes. <laughs> Go on a holiday, think about it by yourself, then talk to a lot of people, and then you probably will get to a conclusion that can keep you going for the next couple of months yeah. or years. And now that you're studying somewhere at university, you might know the story behind the table mm -hmm. where you're sitting on. The table. Yeah, and the chairs. The, seat the tables and the chairs. And the chairs. Mm -hmm. nice. That's a good title for the episode. The story behind the table and the chairs. Yeah, the seafood <laughs> tables. <laughs> they are not see-through. <laughs> How they did the, came there. <laughs> the see-through tables that are not see-through. <gasps> All right, let's wrap it up. Yes. Jill, thank you very much for the, the short but powerful interview. Yeah, thank you. It was very interesting to hear you. about <laughs> your experiences. Um, anyone listening, thank you very much for listening. I uh, hope you can use the advice that we just got. I um, hope it helps in any way. And if you have any questions to me, to Bram, to anyone from the Icarus Idea or to Jill, you can always send us a DM. And leave a like, leave a comment, subscribe, everything, and see you in the next episode. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thanks again. Vic. Right. Alrighty. Do I need to stop my recording now? Yes. yes. Okay. Okay.